Well, welcome again to our Tuesday evening teaching sessions. Over these last uh, couple of weeks, we've been asking that question, when does the Bible become the Bible? And uh, maybe it's uh, for some of us, it's the first opportunity we've ever had to think about how the Bible became the Bible as we now have it today. What I'm really going to approach in this particular session um, is to ask that question, how does something become defined as scripture? Uh, in fact, what exactly is scripture? I guess one of the most quoted verses out of the New Testament would be 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Now, often Christians will use it as a means of affirming uh, their belief that every word that we have in the Bible is inspired. It's an inspired revelation given to us by God. But of course, when you go back to the points when that particular uh, statement was made by Paul, you soon begin to realize that actually it's not as straightforward as we would want to imagine. The truth is that when Paul wrote those words, uh, most of the New Testament hadn't actually even been written. Um, Certainly, there were no Gospels available at that time. And what we have as a New Testament uh, today Um, contained within our Bibles, well, it just simply didn't exist in that kind of format. So when we say all scripture is inspired by God, of course, we're asking it um, to lay claim to something that actually it can't lay claim to, because of course, most of what came within the New Testament came after those words were written. So what exactly is it referring to? Well, I think as we see in verse 15 of 2 Timothy 3, just prior to that particular verse, that the holy scriptures that Timothy has has known since infancy, um, and um, of course what he's grown up to believe in, and then it's claimed, as it's claimed here, to be the true inspired God-breathed word, it's scripture, is of course a reference to what we would call the Old Testament scripture, the Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. And of course, by the time Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, most of that has already been shaped up. So when you read 2 Timothy 3.16, though we might want to apply it to the whole of the Bible, In truth, within its context, it, of course, only refers to the Old Testament scriptures. And that, of course, is different, perhaps, to the way that we've used it in the past. What we've been trying to do in these sessions and uh, will be doing over the next couple of sessions is look at a process. Um, It's quite normal for us to understand that Uh, a novel that we read, um, maybe 250 pages or whatever, written maybe over a period of a year or two. Um, Well, it's quite um, valid for us to to say, well, that's a very straightforward process. The author sat down and over a period of time wrote this and then it was um, edited and then published. We're quite used to a sense of process. When it comes to the Bible, of course, the process is much more complex. And um, we have to ask that question. Well, during the years, um, 1,500 years, um, when did that moment come when people began to generally believe that this wasn't just a collection of important and significant sacred writings, but that this was the inspired, revealed word of God, that this was truly scripture, that God has had his hand 
on the whole process. Now, of course, I'm not anticipating that anyone listening to this particular session this evening or whenever you're listening to it would have any doubts um, that it is inspired. But of course, what we're beginning to discover is that the process of how it moved from being important, significant literature, sacred literature, to that moment when we arrive at that point where we believe that this is the inspired and infallible uh, word of God. Well, that's a big leap and it's a long process. And uh, we're going to spend some time in this session having a think about how that uh, process took place, where we've arrived today believing that what we have when we sit down uh, or to listen to, to read or to listen to scripture, that we're actually hearing the very voice of God speaking through these particular writers. We have two main books, of course, in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testaments. And of course, they are different. They're set within a different uh, context, a different time frame, and they deal with different things. But overall, the vast majority of Christians today would make the claim that they were written by God. Of course, they, didn't, they don't mean that in a literal sense. What they're obviously saying is that even though every individual book has something of the nature of the personality, um, the, the person who's written it in a particular way or with a particular style, even though um, they wrote um, themselves, that actually what was happening was that the Holy Spirit came on them and inspired their writings so that they were able to bring us something more than simply the words of men and women. When Paul sat down to write his letters, he probably wasn't thinking, I'm writing scripture here. He would have simply been writing a letter, an important letter, a letter of guidance, a letter of uh, significance to a particular group of churches or even to an individual. Look at the way that Pete, um, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 13. Um, he, he writes, when you come, bring the cloak that I left behind with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the, the parchments. Well, of course, what, Timoth um, what G Paul is saying there um, in, in that letter is a very human thing. I've, I've forgotten my coat. Well, I don't think anybody would claim that was particularly the inspired word of God, um, nor would we say that that was written by God. So Paul is writing a letter and he's, 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 he's just communicating a simple mes message. So he wasn't sitting down and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm writing part of the Bible here. Um, he would have had no concept of that, nor any understanding of that. He realized that what he said was important because of course it was important for the church to be given good doctrine and good understanding. So the question we're really asking today is, when? did those history books that we find in the Old Testament, poems and the wisdom literature, the prophetic, um, uh, the narratives, the, 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 the gospel stories, the letters, when did they suddenly begin to be uh, viewed as being scripture? Because when they were originally written, the writers would have seen themselves as writing a book or a letter. Well, it's good to ask that question. Uh, first of all, let's see if we can clarify what exactly is scripture? What do we mean by that word? Well, it means it's a sacred literature, um, but it also means that it has authority. It governs the way that um, a particular faith um, practices its traditions, the way that it um, lives life, the way that it expresses its attitudes and its values. So 
it's a two-winged thing in one sense. Firstly, um, it's an acknowledgement that it's sacred, that it's more than just human writings, that there's a flow of God's spirit working through it, but also alongside that, that then it contains authority. Um, it has the power to shape and to provide uh, all that as followers of Jesus, we need for our lives. When you look through scripture, as we would describe it today, um, you can see that some books um, very quickly claim some measure of authority. For example, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter one and verse one, um, it says, these are the words of Moses. Uh, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. Well, straight away, you've got a claim of authority there. Um, this is written by Moses, and Moses is the most significant figure um, in um, Old Testament history. He is the one who brought about the liberation from slavery, uh, the journey from exile into the homeland. So in that sense, immediately, it claims authority. And then if you look at, for example, in the New Testament, something like John 1 and verse 1, again, you find a claim being made there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So both of those books, the Deuteronomy and John's Gospel, in one sense, claim authority. And I think it's fair to say that both of those books, their authority was recognised from almost the moment when uh, they were written down. But of course, when you look at something like Paul's letter to uh, Philemon, for example, well, that's dealing with a problem, um, a quite, quite a personal problem um, about a runaway slave. Um, so when uh, did we arrive at that place where we say, OK, well, Paul's letter to Philemon is just as important and significant as Deuteronomy is, as John's gospel is. It, it carries equal weight. Well, when, of course, did that happen and how did that come about? How did we begin to believe that all of those including the letter to Philemon, were actually inspired by God. Maybe sometimes we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament and we make the false assumption uh, that they were the only uh, books and pieces of literature around that time. Not only they weren't, but they also weren't the only particular uh, books and literature that dealt with some of the issues that they raise. Um, books were written alongside them um, that equally looked at those historical periods or brought some fresh wisdom and insight and, and so on. And of course, the Bible then is, is not an isolated book as, as we have it today. It's a book that was written at a time um, when other books were also being written. So again, that raises all sorts of um, questions for us. We know um, that there are other Gospels uh, which make claims about the life of Christ. We know that there are thousands of books about the history of Israel and so on. Those books are always valued and they're seen as being significant, but they're not quite uh, in the same grouping as those books that we now allocate the definition of scripture to. And of course, what we will find as we go through these next couple of sessions is that over a long period of time, a process took place whereby certain books um, that were written alongside other books were elevated from being books written by significant individuals into the status of scripture, sacred revelation brought to us and inspired 
by God. Some books were immediately accepted and other books had to fight their cause as it were. So how did they go about that? We're now looking at a long period of um, development. And what I want to do is just bring to you eight particular things that governed that process, eight particular values that governed that process. One of the ways that um, we examine the validity of a particular book is we look at it in terms of the way that it makes reference to other books. Um, if you've written an essay, you'll be very familiar with the idea that often you will quote from other sources and you will reference them, what we might term as citations. And one of the ways uh, that, have been, that has been used to determine the value of particular books in terms of their relation to scripture, their status as scripture, is the way that they make reference to other books. For example, in Romans 3 verse 10, it, it has a very common phrase, as it is written. Galatians 4 and verse 30, but what does scripture say? It shows that by the beginning of the Christian era, there were many books in the, of what we would call today the Old Testament, but particular books that were felt to contain um, such a measure of authority and consistency uh, that they began to be accepted as more than just sacred books. They began to be accepted as scripture. So by the time the Christian era came, many of the Old Testament books, particularly the Hebrew scriptures, um, had already been accepted by the early Christians as being uh, worthy of having that title, scripture or scripture is inspired by God. And of course, by um, the time we come to around about the second or third century, um, AD, we begin to see alongside that then there were also books that we now are familiar with within the New Testament that were also given that particular status. They were seen as being books that had great credibility. They drew on the resources of a long tradition of sacred material and they were allocated that term scripture. They became um, a, a grouped with others in, in a way that defined them as being of greater significance, that they were not just great stories or great books or great literature, but these actually were scripture in, in that particular sense. And of course, the way that um, that was worked through, the, the process that took place, was often based on that interaction between the books, the way that they referenced each other, the way that they quoted each other and drew on each other for inspiration. And, and of course, that then provided a consistency um, in their message. It's interesting when you come to uh, the second letter of Peter, uh, which was probably written about 65 through to 68 AD, somewhere in that period, um, already the authority of Paul's letters is, is beginning to be acknowledged. Uh, in 2 Peter 3 and verses 15 and 16, we read these words, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do with other scriptures to their own destruction. So you can see by the time Peter writes his second letter, already much of Paul's writings had moved from being written letters that were very significant to actually being allocated with this term scripture. They had moved from letter to scripture, as of course many books were moving from being books into this 
defined group known as scripture. The second way that um, books were identified as being um, worthy of the titles of scripture was of course to do with their authorship. Every book in the Bible is linked uh, with a person who is seen as being important in the history and the story of salvation. Remember how the story of salvation is the most significant story within scripture. No matter what else we read about, the thread, the, th um, the seam that continues through scripture is that it unfolds the story of salvation. And if writers, authors, were considered to be significant in the telling of that story, um, if they were uh, quoted within those books or um, they were uh, assumed to have written those books or at least uh, the books were written about them, um, then they, the authorship uh, became very significant. Um, for example, if they were linked to David or Solomon or Moses or some of the prophets or the apostles, then they were considered to have greater weight than many of the books um, that weren't. So in that sense, authorship gave the books great status and authority. The third factor is the date when these books were originally brought together. Many of the, uh, the books that we find in uh, the Bible, of course, were not written in one go. Um, they were a collection of material brought together. And generally, books that were written prior to the end of the exile, the exile being very significant, so around Ezra's time, um, and of course, those books that were written within a generation of Jesus, well, both of those would have given them greater scriptural authority and status. The fourth factor uh, that was um, brought into the process of bringing these books together, transferring them from being books or letters to being scripture, uh, was of course their relevance. Um, these books needed to have a relevance, not just for the immediate, but for generations yet to come. So when we sit down and read scripture today, it has a relevance for our lives. And that was very important over that long process to those who were working uh, with the material to bring about this sense of uh, a book of unity um, and purpose. Of course, it had to be relevant. It had to speak beyond a single generation. And alongside that, the fifth one would be its universality. It would have been no good for these books just to relate to one group of people within one particular context or setting. Otherwise, these books would not have been valued by subsequent generations or people beyond um, the context in which they were written. And of course, that was very important that the books that were brought together and defined as scripture had a universal appeal. They were books that were capable of connecting with life right across the known world as it was at that time. And of course, the world, this great global world that we live in today. In other words, these books had to be for all time and for all people. The sixth factor had to be consistency. Uh, their message and the meaning of their message had to be consistent. Um, so if we take Mark's account of the life of Jesus, and then we look at Luke's account of the life of Jesus, if they were completely different, then that would call into question their validity. But because they overlap to a large extent, there was a sense of consistency about it. And though often we divide the Bible up into Old Testament and New Testament, quite rightly, nonetheless, there's a sense of consistency that comes through um, the, th the, the general seam of Scripture that is quite remarkable. 
And that was very important to all those who over a long period were beginning to define these books and these letters as scripture, as being inspired by God. The seventh factor uh, was the meaning. They had to have a meaning that went beyond their immediate context. And of course, the personality of the particular a writer. They had to be more profound and more far reaching than, um, than they would have been um, seen to be at that particular time when they were first written down. And they had to have this, this sense of, this has meaning um, that goes beyond what would have been the original intention of the particular writers or editors or series of writers. And so meaning was very important. It had to mean something that was deeper and beyond the obvious and immediately. And finally, this whole understanding that these were holy books. Scripture, of course, was written a long time ago. Um, and it, 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 it talks very much in, in terms um, that are often very distant from us in terms of their immediate context. But of course, the books contain sacred material. Um, they have insights and understandings into the truth of who God truly is. His name is brought to us. He's Yahweh or he's Jehovah or he's Elohim or, or whatever. He's Jesus, he's the Christ and so on. This is sacred material and it all connects together. And when you put all these factors, factors together, all eight of these, you begin to see um, a pattern or a structure, almost like a grid. Um, that over centuries was thrown over all these uh, amazing books and letters, sacred writings, and, and they were brought together um, with a view of holding together under the basis of all of these factors. And that began to shape the way that people began to see a book that was written a very long time ago as more than just a great book, but as the inspired word of God. A letter that was written a very long time ago would become scripture for us. That's rooted by the streams of life. 